Hello and welcome to another one of my nagging thoughts. If this is your first time joining me and you're tempted to click off in less than 30 seconds, please just take a quick moment to leave me a comment. Let me know what it is you were expecting when you clicked on my nagging thoughts. I'd very much like to understand this behavior that I can see through the analytics. That being said, I want to turn my attention to this week's topic, which is the final installment on this series on divorce that I'm uh, currently going through. And this week, what I'd like to examine is 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, verses 10 and 11. I was going to do more of this passage, uh, but I really want to answer this question. Is a believer under biblical moral obligation to reconcile with a spouse once they have divorced? Um, I want to answer this question because I keep coming across the idea that yes, we do. We have to either remain unmarried uh, for life uh, without any grace or we have to reconcile with the spouse that we divorced. And uh, let's go ahead and read this passage to see why it is that people are coming to that conclusion. Okay, so this is for 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11 in the New English translation. It says, To the married, I give this command. Not I, but the Lord. A wife should not divorce a husband. But if she does let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and a husband should not divorce his wife in this series i have um gone through god's word in both uh, deuteronomy chapter 24 as well as matthew 19 to point out that both in the original hebrew that's in deuteronomy and the original greek that's in matthew make a distinction in god's word between a physical sending away in divorce and a legal divorce and um that is an important distinction to keep in mind when you are reading God's Word because all these concepts are often rendered as the single word divorce in English and it's not referring to the same concepts whatsoever and um, God's Word becomes much richer when you read it with the proper understanding of what the words are that are that God chose to put in his word um, sounds like I have a crow who's uh, trying to take over my nagging thoughts, but that's okay. Um, so what I want to begin with is to take a close look at this word divorce that is in uh, verse 10. And what's interesting is it's actually neither the uh, physical divorce or the legal divorce. It's actually the idea of being separated. It's the word corizo, and it comes from the word... I'm probably going to butcher this, is Korah, which means a vacated space um, or to vacate. So it's, it's really talking about the idea of separation. And in fact, there are many English translations that render this word as separation. And that is a more accurate um, rendering of what this, this is talking about. So if we reread this passage with the understanding that we're talking about a separation instead of divorce, this makes absolute perfect sense to me. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife should not separate separate from her husband, but if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. I'm going to stop right there. So um, I've actually been through a separation. Um, not only was I married for 18 years and did a well over two years of Christian marriage counseling, the first uh, roughly two years of that counseling ended in a controlled separation that was recommended through our Christian counselors uh, because what had happened is that our marriage counseling had effectively turned into enabling. So we were first trying to get help for the marriage, which turned into getting help for my now ex-husband, which then turned into a crutch to where he was never made well or whole. So, um, they recommended 
a separation and a controlled separation means that there are terms that need to be met in order to reconcile which uh, by the way is exactly uh, the way that God did it when he divorced his beloved in uh, and that's a divorce not a separation uh, but when he divorced his beloved in uh, Jeremiah Jeremiah and I will get to that uh, a little bit later um, but in any case that is the point of a separation. It is in instances where there is uh, dangerous behavior that uh, will not stop. Somebody has become a slave to sin because they are practicing sin. And even though you've tried to reason with them and you've got other people to try to reason with them, they refuse to change. So you don't want to give up the marriage. You separate from them and give them one for more final consequence uh, to, to say this behavior needs to change. Now, it could be a behavior that is uh, violent. It could be an addiction. Um, it could be any number of things, but I would say you probably don't want to uh, seek any kind of separation, especially on your own. Um, even though the deck is probably going to be stacked against you ladies in the conservative Christian circles, I still recommend getting other people involved so that you have the clear conscience knowing that you've done everything within your ability to try to save this marriage and avoid divorce. That is how you reveal a hard heart in your spouse, which is the only legitimate reason, according to Matthew 19, 8, that Jesus said we should have divorce in his law whatsoever. So um, let's, okay, so as I said, the, the, the word when it's saying a woman should not separate, it's the, the word uh, separate, it's not the word divorce, but the interesting thing is when it says that the husband should not divorce, um, it is referring to this uh, physical sending away. Um, the word that we see here when it says that the husband should not divorce, it is the word afi, afi which means to send away. And it's coming from the word apu and haimi. Apu meaning away from, haimi meaning send. So you're sending them away. You're physically getting rid of them, which is not legal divorce. Um, so it, uh, really what these two verses are saying is that you really should not just uh, physically cast one another aside. Um, and if you do, you know, the, the obligations towards the marriage just simply do not go away. You, you are still obliged to them because there has been no legal divorce. So that, um, I think is a very, um, important distinction that is in God's word that is important to understand. Um, but let's move on to the, this question, do you have to get reconciled? Well, right away, I'm going to say absolutely not in deuteronomy uh, 24 verses 1 through 4 god makes it clear that once your spouse has been defiled sexually by sleeping with somebody else even if it's in the confines of marriage that it defiles the land if you get back together with them if you reconcile with them this is echoed in Jeremiah 3, 1, and this is what it says in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, verse 1. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and becomes another man's wife, he may not take her back again. Doing that would utterly defile the land. But you, Israel, have given yourself as a prostitute to many gods. So what makes you think you can return to me, says the Lord. Now, there's a couple things that I think are important to point out. The word is Rael literally means those who struggle with God. So when it's talking about Israel, it's not talking about an ethnic group of people. It's talking about the community of believers because not all of Israel is Israel, um, as it says in the word of God. Um, but the other thing that's important to note here is that Israel in this verse did not marry her lovers. This is very much like our modern internet age where uh, they are a prostitute, a, a harlot, if you will, to many. Um, maybe in the old days, uh, in my parents or my grandparents' generation, when people committed adultery, it was with one person and they fell in love and wanted to marry that one person. Uh, but in today's internet age, people um, are able to aggregate and uh, make themselves a prostitute to, uh, to many and develop uh, online cyber harems basically but in any case when that happens god says when that person has sexually become one flesh with another they have defiled themselves and god says you defile the land if you get back together with somebody after such a thing however 
our God being the gracious, loving God that he is, he is still willing to reconcile with us even though we have given him nothing but disloyalty and spiritual adultery. In the very next chapter in Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 1, this is what it says. If you Israel want to come back to me, says the Lord, if you want to come back to me, you must get those disgusting idols out of my sight and must no longer go astray. So God is willing to reconcile with his wayward adulterous ex-spouse under the condition that there's genuine confession and genuine repentance, which is not just something that is confessed by the mouth, but it is exhibited in behavior. This is a concept that I think correlates very easily to reform doctrine in the concept of the perseverance of the saints. You don't merely make a confession of faith, but there must be fruit in your life. You cannot uh, just have faith without works. You must have works by which to display your faith. So um, this is the remarkable thing that even though it defiles the land to get back together with an adulterous ex-spouse, God is willing to do it and he makes it clear in Ezekiel that he does not do it for us. It's not that he's so in love with us that he's willing to put up uh, with such behavior. He does it for his own name's sake and to exonerate his name among the unbelievers by which they're blaspheming him because of our sinful behavior. So um, God truly is remarkable. He truly is gracious. If anybody uh, really, <clears throat> I think, has a desire to deeply understand what marriage is, the purpose of marriage, and what it's pointing to, I want to encourage you to strongly encourage you to read the book of Hosea, read the book of Jeremiah, and read the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> Which brings me to my next point, and I apologize, my allergies are starting to act up now. This is 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, and it says, <clears throat> For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments do not weigh us down. Now, what's interesting is the legalist seems to understand this when it comes to the adulterer. They're like, yes, there's grace, there's forgiveness. Uh, God forgave us. If you look at Hosea, it's a really extreme picture of how much God has forgiven uh, our adultery. And uh, so when a believer is betrayed in marriage, they tend to put this heavy burden and say, you're obliged to reconcile. And that, I have to say, <clears throat> does not fit the description that his commandments do not uh, weigh us down. Because the reality is, as I pointed out in Ezekiel, God is under no obligation to reconcile with us. And in fact, in doing so, he is going against his law that says you shouldn't do this. So I just wish that we would hold this true, that um, we would keep his commandments and not commit adultery and not develop hard hearts in marriage, uh, but truly desire to uh, model Christ who did not grasp at authority and who uh, was mutually submitting, in, not only in his relationship with the Father, but honestly, when he's on the cross, uh, he has uh, submitted to the evil authority of man who nailed him there with our sin. That is what love is, and it is a service mind. It is an other-mindedness. It is a sacrificial loving. And I just, I wish that we could honor that and keep his commandments there so that we don't have to have this double whammy for the betrayed and say, listen, you've been doing a good job of keeping God's commandments and being faithful in your marriage, but guess what? Now you have to go the extra mile and make up for the sins of your wayward spouse and be extra grace, uh, you know, give him an extra dose of grace um, because you're not entitled any. You, you have to be perfect and then some. Um, I just, I wish that uh, believers would have um, as much grace and desire for his commandments to not weigh down the betrayed as much as they um, know that it does not weigh down the betrayers. Okay, one other uh, thing that I just want to say very quickly is that I did get into a little bit of an argument uh, with somebody on uh, one of the videos having to do with divorce where he's basically posing the question like, what if you have 
somebody uh, who you know committed murder uh, but he was happily married doesn't his wife have to you know remain faithful to him and wait for him to get out of prison I want to bring up the the case of the BTK killer because this man believed in several of the doctrines of grace and not only was he a serial killer but uh, he didn't just uh, kill. He took delight in uh, torturing his victims and, and also the police. And that's the type of mentality that this type of legalism attracts. This type of man empowering dominion over women that never ends. Even after divorce, you still control her. You still own her. That's the type of mentality that, um, that it attracts. And I do uh, just want to say that even if the violence was not directed towards the wife within the marriage, once it's revealed that you're dealing with somebody who's trifling with the word of God and is not um, returning to God in any level of sincerity, that is not somebody you want to be one flesh with. Uh, that is not somebody, especially a woman, wants to submit to. That is uh, something you want to have nothing to do with and you want to expose the evil deeds of darkness and have nothing to do with it. So um, I hope that answers that question. Um, the I guess one other thing I will say um, on that is I just want to kind of sum up this entire series and say that really when uh, Jesus was clarifying God's word on this topic of divorce, uh, particularly in Matthew chapter 19, his point was not to say, uh, once you get married, um, that's a license that you own that person until one of you dies. Um, it's the exact opposite. He said the, the reason why divorce is in his word is because of your hard hearts. So that's what we need to remove from marriage, not divorce. Divorce is in God's law. It is unbiblical to remove divorce from the table. What we need to remove are our hard hearts and replace them with a heart of flesh for God and his word. And that is uh, how his name will be glorified and how people will see that we are true believers is by the love and the, the, the fruit that we bear. And uh, not, not by legal mechanisms that trap people or, or moral uh, legalism that, that traps people um, and makes them uh, subordinate to, to, to a sinner so that they have to live their life in an homage to the sinner. Uh, we are to live our lives as an homage to God alone. So um, I hope that's helpful to you guys. And um, I look very much forward very much to next week where I start to uh, tackle the topic of remarriage. So until then, I hope you have a great week and God bless.